Okay, so I hope you all enjoyed your long weekend. So before we get into it, a couple announcements. So firstly, um, your quiz grades are out. They were just finished a couple hours ago, and you should have gotten an email from Gradescope. Uh, this should say 34. Um, so the total number of points possible were 34, um, but that's because you had to choose and do one of question three or question four, okay? So your actual, actual score is really out of 25. So your score is actually your score on question one plus your score on question two plus the max of your score on question three and question four, okay? Out of 25. So for example, like, let's say you left all of question one blank, but then got question three and four, it wouldn't give you a perfect score. Right, although your raw grade scope total might indicate that. Your score, no matter what, will be this. But that won't be calculated on grade scope. That's just something for you to know. Okay? Um, question 4B was graded incorrectly. The rubric item on grade scope was wrong. Um, but uh, the solutions have the correct, uh, correct answer. And I believe this was recently fixed. So if you check your grade scope now, it might look a little different um, than it did an hour or two ago. Okay, overall, the class did very well. Um, the statistics were included in the email. They are a little um, off because that's assuming it's out of 34 when it's really out of 25. Um, but either way, you can sort of see the trend. Um, and a solutions and the, um, a blank copy of the quiz, if you want to like take it again, for example, they're linked on the website. Okay, if you have any questions about your performance on the quiz, feel free to reach out. Okay. Also, our second quiz is in a week from Thursday, okay? So things are, things are starting to pick up. It's like the, the semester has started, if you know what I mean. Any questions logistically about what's going on? Cool. Okay, so last week we introduced proofs and we looked at um, a few different types of proofs, okay? So we looked at some direct proofs and then we introduced the idea of proofs by contradiction and proofs by cases, or sorry, uh, of contraposition, right? So we looked at the first three, okay? Direct, contradiction, and contraposition. What we'll do today is go over those techniques again, um, just to you know, reiterate what we talked about um, on Thursday, um, go over a few more examples, and then also look at proof by cases, okay? And then proof by induction is a whole other thing, and we'll start talking about that on Thursday, hopefully. Okay? So just to review, a proof by a contradiction, we want to show that some statement S is true. And what we do is we begin by assuming the negation of our statement, i.e. that S is false. And, you know, after a valid series of steps, we'll arrive at some sort of contradiction. Okay? So this is how we do a proof by contradiction. And we went over a few examples of this in lecture last week. And I believe there are some examples of this on your homework as well. Okay, so you assume that the statement you want to prove is true is false, and then arrive at a contradiction. Okay, this tells you that your initial statement is true. Okay, then we had a proof by contraposition, and this usually holds when we want to prove something of the form P implies Q, right? When we want to prove this statement P implies Q, all we want to do is show that this implication holds a true value. Right, because this is just an operation made up of ors, ands, and nots. And we want to show that it holds a true value. Another way we can do that is show that it's contrapositive, not Q implies not P holds a true value. Okay, so sometimes it may be easier to proceed with a proof by contraposition, and we can do that. And you know, by the laws and rules of logic that we've looked at, proving the contraposition to be true is the same as proving the original statement. Any questions with all of this? Cool. So now let's look at an example. Okay, so we want to prove that if A, B, and C are odd integers, then there are no integer solutions to AX squared plus BX plus C. Okay, so we want to prove that if A, B, and C are odd integers, then there are no integer solutions to this. Okay, 
And the hint I'll give you, I'll let you work on this for a minute or two amongst yourselves. The hint I'll give you is, let's do this using a proof by contradiction. Okay? And remember, um, you can see that this statement sort of looks like P implies Q. And what's the negation of P implies Q? Anyone? Negation of P implies Q? Yeah. Right, so the negation of P implies Q is P and not Q. So what we'll do is assume that there uh, A, B, and C are odd integers and that there are integer solutions to this. AX squared plus BX plus C is equal to zero. Okay? Um, so I'll give you a minute or two to work on this um, with those near you and try and find a contradiction. Yeah, well, so what, we're not proving the negation. We're assuming that the negation holds true, and then we arrive at a contradiction. Uh, yeah, so this is a, we'll do this as a proof by contradiction. Okay, so I'll let you work on that for a minute or so. Okay, let's come back together. So can someone walk me through what they found? If anything. Anyone? Okay, let's walk through it. So let's assume there are integer solutions to this equation, right? So let's assume we can factor this, right? Because if there are integer solutions to this equation, we can factor it, right? So let's write ax squared plus bx plus c as um, ax plus b times cx plus d. Okay, I should have mentioned this. Actually, what we'll show is that there are no rational solutions to this equation. Okay? And if there are no rational solutions to this equation, that also means there are no integer solutions. Is that clear? It's like saying, if there are no animals with this one property, that means there are also no dogs with that property. Right? Because dogs are a subset of animals, just like integers are a subset of the rationals. So if we prove that this doesn't hold for any rational number, then that's the same as showing that it proves, uh, that it holds, or it doesn't hold, I guess, for any integer. Is that clear? Okay, so we will show that no rational. Okay, and so of course I said we're doing this as a proof by contradiction. So assume there exist rational solutions okay and then here we're implicitly saying that the solutions are 
AX, or sorry, um, negative B over A and negative D over C, right? Because if this was set to zero, then we would have X is equal to negative B over A or X is equal to negative D over C. Is that clear? So we're saying, as a proof by contradiction, let's assume that there are rational solutions. Let's call them negative B over A and negative D over C. Okay, but actually writing out the negative B over A and negative D over C isn't that important for this specific proof. Okay, that's not where the contradiction is going to come from. Okay, I've factored it like this because if there are rational solutions, um, this factorization will exist. Okay, and let's see what happens when I expand this out. Okay, um, when I multiply the, the x terms, I'll get AC x squared. Then um, when I multiply AX and D, I'll get AD. And then B and CX, I'll get BC X plus BD. Is that clear? Okay, and now when I compare what I had, I have little a is equal to AC. Okay, little b is equal to AD plus BC. And little c is equal to BD. So can anyone try and find the contradiction? Yeah. Uh, a, little a, b, and c are supposed to be odd integers. Right. If you multiply like two terms, even if they're odd, you'll get an even number. Right. Can you elaborate a little bit more? Yes, like if like a and c, even if they were odd numbers, or big a and big c, even yeah. if they were odd numbers, if you multiply them, you get an uh, even number no matter what. And so that means like little a can't be an odd integer. It's not that if you multiply them, you'll get an odd number. It's that if you add two odd numbers, you get an even number. Right? Okay, so what we'll do first is first let's look at AC. Consider little a is equal to big A times big C. We know little a has to be odd because that's what we're assuming. And the only way for a product of two integers to be odd is if they're both odd. Right? Because if at least one of them is even, the thing will be even. Right? Since a is odd, big A and big C are also odd. Is that clear? Because we're saying little a is going to be odd. This tells us that big A and big C have to be odd. So similarly, let's consider little c is equal to b times d. The same logic holds. Since we're assuming that little a, little b, and little c are all odd, since little c is odd, b and d are also odd. Okay, so what we've seen now is that little a, little b, or sorry, um, big A, big B, big C, and big D all have to be odd. Is that clear? And then where does the contradiction come from? When we look at little b, which is equal to AD plus BC, A times D, this is odd. And b times c, that's odd. And what do we get when we add two odd numbers? An even number, right? But we started off assuming little a, little b, and little c are all odd. But we just showed that b has to be even. b can't be odd and even at the same time, so this is a contradiction. And that's our contradiction. Is that clear? So what I said was that let's do this by contradiction. Let's assume P holds and the negation of Q holds. So let's say that there are odd in integers A, B, and C such that this holds. And we showed that if that were true, then B would have to be both even and odd at the same time, which is not possible. And that's a contradiction. And therefore, um, the original statement holds. So this is an example of doing a proof by contradiction. Yeah? Wait, how does that contradict the fact that there exists rational solutions? Can you elaborate a little? Because the original thing you assumed was that there exists rational solutions, right? So the contradiction is supposed to contradict that. 
No, no. So the the statement itself is that there are no rational solutions. Okay. So maybe what I should have done is crossed out integer and written rational. Okay. So the original statement is saying that there are no rational solutions. And then the contradiction, we assume that there are rational solutions and arrive at a contradiction. Is that clear? Yeah, yeah. I, I wrote it a little confusingly. Maybe I should have just had the original question say rational. Okay? So the original statement is saying that there are rational solutions, or so that, that there are not rational solutions. The contradiction, so to do that we need to find the negation. The negation is that there are rational solutions, and then we arrive at a contradiction. And therefore, the original statement has to be true, meaning that there are not rational solutions. Is that clear? Yeah. Oh, and then saw that like. Right, right. And you could do casework there. Yeah, I mean there are, there are several ways to do this. Another one, another way could, to do this would have been suppose you have x minus r one and x minus r two, and you do casework. Like you say, what if both of them are odd? What if both of them are even? What if one's even and one's odd? And you'll see that in all the cases, at least one of the coefficients has to be even. Is that clear? Okay, and we'll talk about proof by cases in just a little bit. Another question? Yeah. Yeah. No, no. So, the, like, the act of proving that, I don't know, the square of an even number is even, or like the product of two odd numbers is odd, like, you can assume that these things are true. The only reason they would appear as a homework question is just so you get familiar with proof techniques. But those kinds of things are assumed to be true. Yeah. Okay, um, let's look at another example. And now this is going back to set theory. So we want to prove that if A is a subset of B, then for any other set C, the intersection of A and C is a subset of the intersection of B and C. So I'll let you work on this for a minute or two with those in your Okay, so what I want to do is rewrite what we're given and what we're required to prove in terms of some of the common logical uh, notation we've seen. So we're given that A is a subset of B. What this tells us is that if some element X is in A, then it also has to be in B. Is that clear? So what we can say is that X is in A implies X is in B. Is that clear? If we know X is in A, it tells us it has to be in B. What we're now asked to show is that if x is in A and x is in C, right, i.e. x is in the intersection of A and C, that implies that x is in B and x is in C. 
Is that clear? Any questions with this? Right, and the second property really just uses the fact that if some element is in the intersection of two sets, that that means it has to be in the first and in the second. And um, we got the implication by doing what we did in the given statement, right? If one set, if set box is a subset of set triangle, then everything in box has to be in triangle. Another way of putting that is if you know this, the element is in the box, that implies that it's also in the triangle. Right. Any questions with this? Okay, so how can we proceed? No, I didn't say that this has to be a contradiction or contraposition or direct or anything. You can do this however you want. I, I'll tell you right now, the easiest way to do it is by direct proof. But I'm open to hear anything. Okay, well, so the way I wrote the required to prove statement really did most of the work for us. Okay, um, so, so let, okay, why don't we do that? So let's say X is in the intersection of A and C. Okay, let's try and write this a little more like an intersection symbol. This means X is in A and X is in C. Okay. Now, the way I'm approaching this is as if I hadn't written this sentence, because otherwise, that sentence really does most of the work for us. Okay, so now I'm just looking at the original statement. Okay, so we know that if, let's consider some element X that's in the intersection of A and C. Well, if it's in the intersection of A and C, it means it's in A and it's in C. But if X is in A, then X is in B. Right, so all we're starting off by assuming is that X is in the intersection of A and C. Well, if it's in the intersection of A and C, it has to be in A and in C. But if it's in A, that tells us it also has to be in B. So that means we know it's in both B and C. Is that clear? Maybe it might make a little more sense if I just erase this line here. Okay, not that the line was wrong, but the fa the the majority, like the most of the work in this question, revolves around converting this statement to x is in A and x is in C. Okay, that's the majority of the work required to do in this question, and by writing the problem that way, it sort of got rid of all of that work. Okay? So we're saying consider any arbitrary element in the intersection of A and C. What we want to show is that it has to also be in the intersection of B and C. Okay? Um, just by assuming that X is in A intersects C, that doesn't mean I'm assuming the statement to be true. I'm only looking at one side of the, um, I guess, subset symbol, and I'm arriving at the other side. Right? Um, I'm assuming that X is in one of the elements in the intersection um, on the left, and I show through what we're allowed to assume that it's also one of the elements in the intersection on the right. Is that clear? Any questions with this? Cool. And so now, to further things a little, if we want to prove a statement of the form something, if and only if, something else, we essentially have to perform two separate proofs. One where we prove P implies Q, and another where we prove Q implies P. Okay? And it's important that we do both of these. Okay? And one thing you'll notice is that sometimes one direction of the proof is significantly easier than the other direction. 
Okay, and that's just sort of how math works. Okay? And so as an example, suppose we're given that A, B, X, and Y are natural numbers, where big A is equal to little a plus 1 over x, and big B is equal to little b plus 1 over y, and that y divides a, and that x divides b, prove that the product, a times b, is an integer, if and only if, x and y are both equal to 1. Okay, so there's a lot to take in, um, a lot of conditions here. But the point of this is that we have to do two separate proofs here. Okay, the two directions, one is that if x equals y equals 1, then a times b is an integer. And the other is that if a times b is an integer, then x is equal to y is equal to 1. Okay, with all those conditions also holding. Okay, and we have to do these separately, and once we've done both of these individual proofs, we've proven the entire thing, that the first condition holds if and only if the second condition holds, essentially telling you that they're equivalent. So any questions with this outline? Um, when you say x divides b, that means that like, b over x or x over b? It tells you that b over x is an integer. Okay. Yeah, just as a reminder, um, a divides b is the same as there, there exists some c in the integers such that b is equal to a times c. Okay? One example is that 8 divides 24. Okay? But 24 does not divide 8. Little number, then big number. Okay? Is it clear what our two separate proofs in this case have to be? Okay, so let's do it. So we don't have enough space for the second one on this slide. So for now, let's just do the first one. Okay? So we're saying if x and y are both equal to 1, then this product is an integer. Okay? So this case ends up being very simple, right? Let's substitute x equals y is equal to 1 into this expression. Okay? So we want to look at the product of a times b. Well, that's equal to a plus 1 over x times b plus 1 over y. Okay? Well, if x and y are both equal to 1, this simplifies to just a plus 1 times b plus 1. Is that clear? And then we do some expansion. You know, a, b plus a plus b plus 1. This is just a sum and product of integers, which we know the result will also be an integer. Okay, so that's really all we have to prove for the one direction. Right? We're saying if x and y are equal to 1, then this product is an integer. The real work will be in the other direction, saying that if this product is an integer, then it tells us that x and y have to be equal to 1. Is that clear? Okay, so let's do that. So now we're saying um, if uh, this product is an integer then x and y are 1. Well, what's the product? Well, again, that's just a plus 1 over x, b plus 1 over y, I believe. Right? Yep. Okay? Let's expand it out. Well, we have a, b plus a over y plus b over x plus 1 over x, y. Is that clear? Okay. And now, what can we simplify, you know, based off of what we're told in the question? What's some important information that we're given in the question? Yeah. Good. We're told that y divides a and x divides b. Okay, so now what we want to do is show that all of these constituent parts of the sum are integers. Okay, and if we can do that, it tells us the entire thing is an integer. Right? 
So this is an integer. Okay, so is this, since y divides a. Right? And the whole definition of a divides b means that the, the quotient of b divides a is an integer, or b over a, I guess, right? 8 dividing 24 just means that there's the result of dividing 24 by 8 is an integer. So we know that a over y is an integer. Similarly, this is an integer since x divides b. And now we need to show 1 over xy is also an integer. Okay? How can we proceed here? Yeah. Yeah. So what this bar means, A divides B, just tells you that A is a factor of B. That's another way you can look at it. Okay? Another way to look at it is if you take the division B divided by A, the result is an integer. Okay? So 8 divides 24, but 5 does not divide 24. Is that clear? Okay. And so since we're told Y divides A and X divides B, the result A over Y and the result B over X, those have to be integers. Cool? And so since we have the first three elements in the sum are integers, we need to sh just show now that the last one is an integer and we've shown that the entire thing is an integer. Okay? So how can we show that 1 over XY is an integer? Or rather, I should have rephrased that. What conditions must be true for 1 over XY to be an integer? Yeah. Okay, well, so they can't be negative one because we're looking at just the naturals, right? And so this is only possible when x and y are both equal to one because if the product x times y was anything other than one, this would not be an integer, right? It would be one over something that's greater than one. That would be some uh, rational number between zero and one, right? Right. Is everyone convinced that the only way for 1 over xy to be an integer is that x times y is an integer? Right. But xy being equal to 1 implies that x is equal to 1 and y is equal to 1. You're absolutely right that x and y being negative 1 would work if we were allowing x and y themselves to be, in, uh, to be integers. But we said before... A, B, X, and Y are natural numbers. We're just saying that the product is an integer. Okay? Therefore, if uh, A times B is an integer, then it has to be true that X and Y are equal to 1. Okay? So to recap, we had a statement of the form P if and only if Q, and we showed two separate statements. If P, then Q, and if Q, then P. Right, we proved um, if P then Q and the converse of that. Right? Um, a statement P if and only if Q is true if the forward implication and its converse are true. Okay? And we had to show two separate um, proofs, essentially. Right? And we noticed one was significantly easier than the other. One of them we just plugged in. X is equal to Y is equal to 1. And the solution sort of just came from there. The other one we had to do a little bit more work. But it still wasn't too, too bad. Okay, so we showed both of the individual directions, therefore the entire statement holds. So, let's put it here, I guess. Maybe over here. We showed both directions, therefore statement holds. Okay, and I believe there's an example on your homework this week of a if and only if proof. Okay, and I think it breaks it down for you. Uh, I believe there's one where one part is show that if x is even, then x squared is even. And then the other says show that if x squared is even, then x is even. Um, and then you put those two together to get the x squared is even if and only if x is even. Okay, so those are equivalent conditions. Any questions with if and only if proofs? Okay. 
Um, and so we sort of already talked about this, contradictions with implications. We did this at the beginning, right? If we want to prove uh, P implies Q using a proof by contradiction, we can just assume P and not Q, right? And so this is very similar to the one you're doing on your homework. Prove that if X squared is even, then X is even. If we wanted to do this um, using a contradiction, what we could do is say, this is P, this is Q. What would P and not Q be? Well, that would be X squared is even and X is odd. And we would get the contradiction pretty easily there. Right? Because if we say X is odd, then we can write it as 2K plus 1. But if you square that, it will also end up being odd. And that's a contradiction. Because if X is odd, you'll show that X squared has to be odd, which contradicts this statement. Because this is saying that X squared is even. Is that clear? So this is another way to approach the problem in your homework. But there, there are potentially more straightforward ways to do this. But it's just something you have to be aware of. I think a better example of this is the one we did over here. Um, this was a better example of an implication that we prove by doing a proof by contradiction. Okay, any questions with all of this? Cool. So now we want to move into proof by cases. Okay, so um, in many instances, instead of proving a statement directly for any, you know, um, any number in the set that we're concerned with, it's easier to view it, um, to break the original statement down into holding for several separate cases. And if we can show that it holds in every single one of these cases, then we've shown that it holds in general. Okay. And the important thing to worry about is that in a proof by cases, we need to ensure that all possibilities are being accounted for. Okay, you can't miss any elements in the set um, that we're concerned with. Okay, and you can verify this on your own, but suppose we can split our proposition P into two separate sub-propositions, P1 and P2. Showing that P1 or P2 implies Q is the same as showing P1 implies Q and P2 implies Q. Okay, you can, you can, um, we can show this using a truth table. Okay, we won't do it now necessarily, but it's something that you can show. Okay, all this is really saying is that if we break apart our proposition into separate propositions and prove each one individually, then it proves the entire thing. Okay, so the best way to tackle this is by doing um, some examples. So the first one we want to look at is prove that the cube of any integer is either a multiple of 9, one more than a multiple of 9, or one less than a multiple of 9. Okay? And so the first question is what are the cases? Okay, and we need to make sure that these three cases encompass all of the integers. Okay, well, I said three, right? I shouldn't have necessarily said three, but however many cases we come up with, we need to show that every integer is in one of these cases. Okay, otherwise our proof wouldn't be complete. Okay, so I'll let you discuss for a couple minutes amongst yourselves on what these cases might be, how we know for sure that they cover all of the integers, and then start thinking about how we can approach the proof in each of these cases. Okay, so I'll let you work on that for a couple minutes.
Okay. So could someone tell me what they, um, what they think one way to break this up into cases is? Okay, and there isn't necessarily one right answer. There's one that will make it easiest for us, um, but there are definitely multiple answers. Yeah. You could think of um, any integer being either a multiple of three, less than a multiple of three, or one greater than a multiple of three. Exactly. Okay, and so those are the three cases we'll actually um, break our space up into. Every integer is either divisible by three, or has remainder one when you divide it by three, or has remainder two when you divide it by three. Is that clear? And that's an idea that we'll formalize uh, much more when we start talking about modular arithmetic, um, but a lot of these proofs will you know, revolve around these ideas, so I think it's important to introduce it. So um, each integer, maybe you should say every, has remainder 0, 1, or 2 when divided by 3. Okay? So what we can say is that we have three cases. Case 1 is x is equal to 3 times some multiple, uh, sorry, x is equal to 3 times another integer, i.e. it is a multiple of 3. Another case could be it has remainder 1 when you divide it by 3, i.e. it's 1 greater than a multiple. And the last case can be x is 3k plus 2. Another way of writing this could be 3k minus 1. Um, but just to make it a little more clear, I write it as 3k plus 2. So these correspond to the three cases we just identified. Remainder 0, remainder 1, or remainder 2. And we know for sure these, this encompasses all possible cases because every integer can be divided by 3 and every integer will have a remainder of 0, 1, or 2. Is that clear? Any questions with what these cases are? Yeah. Yeah, it would. We haven't really talked about modular arithmetic yet. Um, so let's try and shy away from that for now. But later in the course, yeah. Okay, so this is what I'm claiming the three cases to be. X is either three times some other integer, three times some other integer plus one, or three times some other integer plus two. Okay, notice this is very similar to um, how we write even and odd integers, right? If X is odd, or X is even, we say it's two times another integer. And if it's even, we say it's two times some other integer plus one. And those are the only two cases when you divide by two. So similarly, when you divide by three, there are three cases. If you divide by 100, there'll be 100 cases where that plus term will go from plus zero all the way through plus 99. Okay, so now what we need to do is prove this statement holds for each of these three separate cases, and then if we can show that it holds for each of these cases, since these cases encompass all possible integers x, we've proven this thing. Okay, so let's get into it. So let's say case one. So we're told that x is equal to 3k, and now we want to look at what happens when we cube x. Right? So x cubed is 3k cubed, which is 27k cubed. And all we want to show is that it's either a multiple of 9, one more than a multiple of 9, or one less than a multiple of 9. If it falls in any of these three cases, the cases of being the second part of the statement, um, it's okay. Is that clear? And in this case, we can show that it's actually a multiple of 9. Right? Because I can write this as 9... Also, I should write that k is another integer itself. Times 3k cubed. Is that clear? So we've shown that in this first case, when x is a multiple of 3, that when I cube x, it's a multiple of 9. And so that, that holds. Right? So we've shown that the statement's true in this first case. And now we need to do so, again, for the second case and for the third case. Is that clear? Okay, so now let's look at case two. So x is equal to three times some integer plus one. Okay. Also note that it's important that at some point in this proof, I write k as an integer, right? You might assume that, but if you don't explicitly say k is an integer, then x isn't necessarily an integer either, 
right? If X was a real, like, I don't know, a rational number, then, uh, sorry, if K was an irrational number, then X would not be an integer, right? So you need to specify that K is an integer. Okay, so now let's look at X cubed. Well, in this case, it's 3K plus 1 cubed. Right? Okay, now how can we expand this up? Okay, it doesn't really matter if you remember how to do this from before or uh, you've never seen it before because this is the kind of thing that we'll do towards the end of the course. Um, but this is sort of how it looks. Plus, uh, I believe it's 9K plus 1. That's okay. Okay? And what we need to show is that this is either a multiple of 9, one more than a multiple of 9, or one less than a multiple of 9. We can do that. All right, this is 9 times 3K cubed plus 3K squared plus K plus 1. Okay? And, you know, we've shown that in this case we can write X cubed as 9 times something plus 1. So, therefore, X is... 1 greater than a multiple of 9. So here we can see, therefore, x is a multiple of 9. Is that clear? Okay, so we've shown that the statement holds for case 1. We've shown that it holds for case 2. And then lastly, case 3 we have to show that it holds for x is equal to 3k plus 2. And it will be very similar. Okay, I'll go through it pretty quickly. 3k plus 2 squared. The first term will be this. Um, that should be cubed, actually. Probably 7k squared plus, uh, let's see, 9 times 2, 18. Whatever. You end up showing that it ends with a plus 8. Okay? The specific terms don't matter. And you end up showing that you can write it as 9 times something plus 8. Okay? Well, we can rewrite an 8 as 9 minus 1. Is that clear? And then whatever we got in that box, we can write it as 9 times box plus 1 minus 1. Okay? And we've shown that in this case it happens to be one less than a multiple of nine. So that means in each of the three cases, we've shown that x is either, or x cubed rather, is either a multiple of nine, one greater than a multiple of nine, um, or one less than a multiple of nine. Is that clear? So therefore, since each integer is, falls in one of these cases, is a multiple of three, one more than a multiple of three, or two more than a multiple of three, the statement holds, right? So, since we've accounted for all cases, we've shown the statement holds in general. Any questions with this? No? Okay. And so I don't, I can't remember if there are any questions where you have to break up, um, you know, your set into different cases this week's homework, but if there weren't, then next week's homework, there definitely will be. Okay. So now I'll let you work on another example on your own. Um, and while you do that, you can also throw out the appendix form. Okay, so I'll give you a couple minutes to try this out. Okay, and I'll, the hint I'll give you is that there are four cases that you have to consider. Capital T.
Okay, so what are the four cases in this question? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So we want to be careful with positive and negative. It's, you, you could say positive and non-positive or negative and non-negative because zero has to be included in one of the cases. But um, yeah, the, the general idea is right. So the first case we can look at is when A is greater than or equal to zero and B is greater than or equal to zero. We can also look at, uh, you sure? Good point, okay. Then we can look at when A is greater than or equal to zero and B is less than zero. Then we can look at when A is less than zero and B is greater than zero. And lastly, we can look at when A is less than zero and B is less than zero. Okay, so important thing to remember, how does the absolute value function behave? Well, if the number is non-negative, it just returns the same number, but in the other case, when it's negative, it returns the opposite. Is that clear? Okay, so um, in the first case, when A is greater than or equal to zero and B is greater than zero, do you agree that we have A over B is greater than or equal to zero? Right? Also, since a is greater than or equal to zero, we can say that absolute value of a is just a, and the absolute value of b is just b. Is that clear? And since we have a over b is greater than or equal to zero, if you look at the absolute value of a divided by b, well, since a divided by b is some non-negative number, its absolute value is just itself. Is that clear? So the absolute value of a divided by b is just a divided by b because a divided by, p, a divided by b is non-negative. But in this case, since a is non-negative, a is the same as the absolute value of a. And since b is non-negative, we have b is the same as the absolute value of b. So in this first case, it holds. Is that clear? So the first case, we didn't really have to do a whole lot. But in some of the other ones, it might be a little less straightforward. Okay? So why don't we look at the case when A is greater than or equal to zero, but B is less than zero. Okay? Well, if we're dividing a non-negative number by a negative number, what's the result going to be? Negative, right? So we have that A over B is less than zero, which tells us the absolute value of A over B is what? Neg it's A um, over negative B, right? Is that clear? Because here, well, not that it really matters, but it's the same as negative A over B, right? I guess I can write it like this if it removes confusion, right? Since A divided by B is less than zero, the absolute value of A divided by B is negative A over B, to flip it positive. Also, while the absolute value of A will just be A, because A is not negative, but the absolute value of B will be negative B. Right? Because B is negative, the absolute value result is always non-negative, so we flip it. Is that clear? And so now what we'll do is we'll start with absolute value of A over B, and we know that in this case, it's the same as negative A over B. Right? But I can write this as A divided by negative B. But in this case, a and the absolute value of A are the same thing, and negative B and the absolute value of B are the same thing. So in this case, we've also shown that the absolute value of A over B is absolute A over absolute value of B. Is that clear? And here it was a little different because we had to look at, well, now we're dividing two, um, or well, one non-negative number and one negative number, so the result will be negative, so we have to pull out this minus sign. Yeah? Third step is just you dropping the minus sign down? Yeah, because, yeah, it's, it's, the, uh, it's equivalent. Yeah. 
No problem. And so the third case actually is very similar to the second, right? But really, we just tacked the minus sign onto the A instead of the B. And the fourth case ends up being very similar to the first, because if they're both negative, their um, quotient will be positive or non-negative, right? Um, and here you'll have absolute value of A is negative A, and absolute value of B is negative B, okay? So the logic ends up being very similar to the first case, okay? And once we've shown all four of these cases to be true, I won't do the third and fourth one right now. Since, you know, if we pick any two real numbers, they will follow, or where any two real numbers where the second one isn't zero, they will fall into exactly one of these four cases. And we've proved the statement to be true for all four of the cases, it holds in general. Is that clear? So therefore, the statement holds in. Is that clear? And to be formal, you would also have to complete this proof and complete this proof. I'm skipping it now because I want to look at a few more examples. But if this were you know, a question asked of you in some other context, you would have to explicitly do this for all four cases. Cool. So we've now covered the main styles of proof techniques, okay? Other than induction, which we'll look at starting on Thursday. But the contents or like the um, subjects that we can prove um, statements from, you know, uh, are, are vast, right? Essentially, everything we do in the rest of this course, we can prove properties about, you know, the various structures that we'll see. So just because we've finished talking about proof techniques, quote unquote, doesn't mean we finished talking about proofs because we'll continue talking about proofs you know, for the rest of this course. Okay, so I wanna look at three other ideas that are related to proofs but aren't necessarily proofs themselves that I think you should be aware of. The most important of this will be the last one where we look at different proofs and um, look at what's right with them and what's wrong with them and really where, um, where the flaws in the logic lie. Okay, so I mentioned this earlier on Thursday, what a vacuous proof is, right? And so oftentimes when we want to prove the statement if P then Q, we're not proving that Q is always true. We're saying if P holds, if P is true, then Q is true, okay? There's a difference there, right? And so in 99% of the cases, we will be showing that, we'll assume that P is true and then show with that information Q is true. But that implication also happens to hold true whenever P is false, right? And remember, we can go back to the truth table, which should seem familiar by now. We had T, 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 F. And this is what that looked like, right? So it holds true in the standard case when both P is, P is true and Q is true. It also holds true whenever P is false. Okay, and so an example of that is if the earth is flat, then all dogs can fly. Again, it's not saying that all dogs can fly. It's saying that if the earth is flat, which it's not, then all dogs can fly. Is that clear? So for a more um, mathematical, I guess, example, suppose we're asked to prove that if x squared minus 2, or x minus 2 squared minus 4 is less than negative 6, then 4 is prime. If we're asked to prove that, what we could also do is just show that this initial part, P, is false. And if that's always false, then the implication always holds true. Yeah? Is that just showing that P is in relation to Q? Yeah, that, that's another way of looking at it. If P does not hold, then the implication holds no matter what. Right? And if you ever get confused about implications, I really like the example of holding a promise. Remember that when I said, if it rains tomorrow, I'll give you $100. I highly recommend you look back at that, and it's also in the textbook um, if you, you're ever unsure of what an implication means. Okay? So here what we could do is just show that P is false. Right? And how could we do that? Well, for this to be true, then we would have to have x squared minus 2 is less than negative 2, but box squared is always greater than or equal to 0. So P cannot be true. P implies Q is true. 
Okay, and of course this is not saying that on its own four is prime. It's saying that if the thing on the left hand side is true, then four is prime. Okay, and we implicitly said that x is a real number because if x were complex, then things might be different. Yeah. Wasn't it saying that the thing on the left side is false, then four would be prime. Sure, but what we're saying is that the implication itself is true. Yeah. Again, this is not saying that 4 is prime or that it's not prime. It's not really making a comment on that. This is just saying that if x squared or x minus 2 squared minus 4 is less than negative 6, then this implication is true. Okay? This is not a proof that 4 is prime. Okay? This implication, though, has a true value. Right? And here, uh, we happen to be looking at the last case because 4 isn't prime. But notice, whether or not 4 is prime, the truth value is the same. It's true and true. Is that clear? I, won't, I wouldn't worry too much about the idea of vacuous proofs. Um, you know, maybe it'll appear on a quiz just to keep you alert, but um, this is not something really to be worried about. But it, it is, uh, um, like, if you understand this, it really means you understand implications, okay? Because an implication is nothing but, you know, a combination of ands, ors, and nots that has a truth value. Any questions with this? Great. And so now we'll look at the idea of counterexamples. Okay? And so proof by counterexample is not a thing. Okay? We can't prove something to be true using a counterexample. But what we can, we can use a counterexample for is to prove things are not true. So for example, if we're asked to prove or disprove that all Pythagorean triplets are of the form 3k, 4k, 5k, you know, the, the like, 3, 4, 5. If we're asked to prove that all right angle triangles are, you know, similar to this one, 3, 4, 5, well, we can easily disprove that because we can just find a single counterexample. Okay? So you can use counterexamples to show that statements are not true, right? You, you, you find a case where the statement is, doesn't hold, but you can't use a counterexample to show that a statement holds in general. Similarly, you can't use a, an example to show that a statement holds in general. Right? Counterexamples are, though, a valid technique of showing that some statement doesn't hold. Right? And in future courses, a question that you might see will be, um, consider this statement. If it's true, prove that it's true. If it's false, give a counterexample. Okay? So giving a counterexample is a perfectly valid way of showing that some statement doesn't hold, but it's not a way that you can show a statement does hold. Is that clear? So that's a question that uh, you will probably see come up pretty often. If it's true, prove that it's true. If it's false, give a counterexample. Any questions with counterexamples? Yeah. Can you elaborate? Like, in order to like, make the contribution and the proof by contradiction, can you use a, like, a counterexample to do that? No, because that's equivalent to just using an example to show that your original statement holds. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah. So you can't use a, if you're doing a proof by contradiction, you can't use a counterexample. That's the same as just giving an example that your original statement holds. You can only use a counterexample to show that something does not hold in general. Any questions with this? Yeah. Positive real numbers. Yeah. Any other questions with the idea of counterexamples? Okay. But really, the meat of what I wanted to talk about at the end of today is the idea of looking at various proofs and pointing out the flaw in their logic, okay? And so the examples that I'm going to show you, the flaws might be relatively straightforward, but especially when we get to induction and things get you know, a little more murky, it will be much more difficult to exploit flaws in logic, okay? So one common example that you can see is that prove using induction that um, all people on Earth are the same age. And you can construct a proof that looks to the untrained eye, perfectly valid, 
Okay, but one thing we'll do is, you know, dissect that and look at why it's not true. Okay, but we'll save that for when we get to induction. Okay, so some common mistakes we'll often see, um, you know, the first one is assuming that the statement we're trying to prove holds true to begin with, right? A very common one is dividing by something that which could possibly be zero, which is you can never divide by zero, so that doesn't hold. Um, you know, not switching inequalities, using an example, using a variable in multiple cases to mean different things when it's the same variable. Um, and oft another one is confusing contrapositive with converse. Okay, and so we'll look at an example of that in just a second. But here's an example of something that, again, to the untrained eye, might look valid, right? Let's prove that one is equal to two, right? Let's start off by saying x and y are just some real numbers. Okay, well then, let, let's try and point out the specific line um, where there's a flaw here. And obviously this is a very obvious example, but my point is that they won't necessarily be so obvious in the future, okay? And I believe there's a question on your homework um, where you have to look at a proof and talk about whether or not it's valid, okay? Well, is this true? Well, if x and y are the same number, then yeah, I can subtract by y squared, factor on the left by difference of squares, and on the right by taking out a common factor of y. And then here, how do we get to this line? We divided by x minus y, right? Can't divide by x minus y since x minus y is equal to zero. Okay? And so, and like, you can think of this as saying, if you can divide by zero, then you can show anything to be true. I could have, I could come up with an example showing that pi is equal to 25 if I wanted to. Right, by somewhere throwing in a dividing by zero. Okay, so that's one thing you really need to watch out for. Okay? Here's a more um, involved example. Okay? So suppose we want to prove that if n is an integer and 2n plus 2 is even, then n is odd. Okay? And so, separate from this fact, 2n plus 2 is even regardless of whether or not n is even or odd, right? Because I can write 2n plus 2 as 2 times n plus 1, and it, regardless of what n is, if it's even or odd, 2 times any integer will be another integer, okay? So, the, um, the statement is definitely false, but let's look at the logic, okay? So we're saying let's proceed by contraposition, but we're saying that let's assume that n is odd. Okay, but if we were doing a contrapositive, then um, we would have to assume that n is even, right? Because here, we have that p is the statement 2n plus 2 is even, and q is a statement that um, n is odd. Okay, so if we were doing a proof by contrapositive, you would have to look at not Q, which is that N is even, and not P, which is that 2N plus 2 is odd. Okay? But here, he said, let's assume that N is odd. But that's not the contrapositive. That's not the negation of Q. That's just Q itself, right? Uh, proof tries to use the converse as opposed to the contrapositive, right? And I think we mentioned this here. That's a common, ex common example of, you know, where logic, or like where the contrapositive and converse might be confused, right? So this proof attempts to use the converse instead the contrapositive. Okay, and so that's where the logic falls out, right? Notice if you were to actually do this properly and start off with not Q, that N is even, it would be impossible to show that 2N plus 2 is odd. Because 2N plus 2 will always be even. So you'd, you'd try to do this and you wouldn't be able to show it so you'd say that the statement is not true. Yeah. Can you ever get something like this where we 
had not exactly told that uh, it's an impossible statement, and they not like told that this person disprove it, they just said like prove this. And we are supposed to assume like by our own intuition that this is wrong and like I can it possibly be correct. So you're saying, will you ever be asked the question that prove this statement is true, but it actually won't be true? Yeah. Um, probably not. If you're ever asked to prove something, then it's implied that it's true. But if there's a question, like there will be questions of the type that you're asking, but those will more likely read prove or disprove, right? And so suppose we didn't know whether or not the statement was true. We decide to proceed with contraposition. We would get here and then look and say, well, it's impossible to show that not Q implies not P. That means the statement doesn't hold. Right? Okay. So that's just another thing to be aware of. And then lastly, here's an interesting one that I found on a memes page. Okay. Let's prove that one is the greatest whole number. Okay. Um, this should say whole. Let's see, and zero. Okay, so let's assume that n is a whole number and that it's the greatest whole number. Okay, since it's the largest, when its square has to be less than or equal to. Okay, makes sense, right? If it's the largest number, any function you apply to it has to be less than or equal to it, right? And so you get n squared is less than or equal to n. But I can factor the left-hand side, or subtract n, on, n from the right, uh, and then factor the left-hand side, which tells me I have two solutions, 0 and 1. But since 1 is greater than 0, I have that um, 1 is the greatest whole number. Okay? Seems legit. Where is the flaw in the logic here? Yeah? Uh, just having the square test Okay, there's actually a flaw even before that. Yeah. Yeah, it's assuming that there is a greatest whole number. Right. Okay, the flaw in logic here is that we're assuming that there is a greatest whole number. Um, we're not assuming that it's equal to 1. That's what we prove here. Um, but we, we just exist, we assume that, that this quantity exists when it doesn't. Okay, so if you assume something that's not true to be true, you can really show anything. Right? And this is another example of that. If you assume that you can divide by 0, you can show anything <coughs> to be true. Right? So this, this one's a little more subtle, but you just have to be careful that you're not assuming anything to be true that you can't actually assume. Yeah. Okay. So the question you're asking is, remember when we proved uh, that there is no greatest even integer, right? And so there, the, con we, the, the negation of that, well, we can walk through it now because we have a little bit of time. So prove... Okay, so we want to prove that there's no greatest even integer. So we'll do this by proof by contradiction. Let's assume M, or like let's say assume N M is the greatest. And then we found a contradiction, which says that the thing we assumed is not true. So the opposite of what we assumed is true. But since we flipped it in the beginning, this tells us that our original statement is true. Is that clear? So here we assume, let's say m is the greatest even integer. Well, n, which is m plus 2, is even and an integer and greater than m. So therefore, m is not the greatest even integer. That's a contradiction. And so that means the thing we're assuming is false. That means the original thing we had is true. Is that clear? Okay, um, on Thursday we'll start talking about induction.